Nice to see such a good crowd here today. Thank you for coming. Am I being heard all right? Yes, sir. Oh, good. Thank you. I have a couple exercises that I'd like to try with you all today. And primarily, the basic question will be, what would you do if you were in the same situation? And actually, I have, a, I have an audio from YouTube of a situation that I've been in. Maybe some of you have been in, too. It's fairly common. But it's one in which... There's somebody else that is crowding in on your space. And there's literally, literally nothing you can do about it. Except maybe in the spiritual realm. But before we get to that, I had something very interesting happen just before the service today. And that is I got a text message from a lady who two, three years ago was very disruptive in the Yahad and did me a great disservice that cost me mentally, spiritually, and financially. I haven't heard from uh, that person since the incident, and I, I, I don't think anybody here is going to know who that is anyway. But what she wrote to me was that finally she needed to settle this and get forgiveness and that she wanted to repent because her karma was catching up with her. Karma. Maybe you remember that song from about 30 years ago, Instant Karma is Going to Get You. So evidently, th through these years, this, well, I guess you'd call it sin, has been building up with her to the point where she just couldn't stand it anymore. And what I told her was that I have forgiven her a long time ago, although the memory is still pretty flat, fresh in my mind. Yet, according to Torah, there's more to repentance than just admitting you were wrong. There's restitution to be made. Yes, I wrote to her that I'll expect restitution. If you, of course, she follows Torah and all. And she said, I don't want to be your friend. What would you require of me? And I'll leave it at that for right now. Let you think about that. See if, um, see what you come up with there. I had to think about it a little bit, but I came up with something. And think about the fact that Torah does demand restitution. And I don't need to quote you verses. You already know. Moshe used to make them make a public apology, a heartfelt apology. Well, I'm not going to get that. And it wasn't just me that the offense was too. But like I said, this was since, um, since I guess we've been online, this is about the probably the worst thing that's ha ever happened to me. But I'll leave it at that. Now I want to play about 15, 20 minutes of this audio. And I want you to get into it and see by the time we're about half done with it, uh, what you're thinking you might do. I'd like to get an answer from you from a carnal perspective and also from a Torah perspective, okay? So I'm going to move over now to share 
my audio with you. There's no video to go along with it. First, I got to find it. And as I said before, this may have happened to you in the past. It has happened to me, so it must have happened to a lot of people, but it has to do with buying a duplex. And here we go. There might be a little bit of lead in here. I don't know if there's so bad on This is my story that I thought I'd never live to tell. When desire overtakes reason, the human mind can unleash deadly obsession. These are true stories told by the victims. On the day that I found my duplex, I was working with my realtor and my realtor knew that I, she knew my constraints and she also knew that I liked something of a little bit of character, a little bit quirky. And so my realtor found a place for me. I was looking for a cheap place to live. The reason why I wanted to buy a home was I was in my uh, mid thirties and in my mind, it was just long past the time to become responsible and settle down. Is it okay if I check in here? Everything just seemed like I found everything perfect. And um, it's available right away? That's right. Oh, so much. <laughs> My primary limitation was budget. So immediately it just meant that I was going for a small place to live. I knew I'd be sharing a wall. I definitely just wanted a place where the walls wouldn't be paper thin so we wouldn't be hearing each other. Thank you so much. I absolutely love it. It's so gorgeous. And the price is insane. Thank you. Um, I, I got to go, so uh, thank you very much, and I'll give you a call. Thank you. In other words, I'm getting out of here. It was on a good side of town, so no criminal activity that I could find, no railroad tracks, no crazy anything, um, just gorgeous landscaping. Um, everything just seemed just perfect, and the price was exactly within my range. It was the first place that I fell in love with, that I, that I had that emotional attachment to. Everything else, I just said, mm, it's not quite there. And when I talk about the other things that worried me, like the safety and the railroad tracks, I know that if, that if I just liked the place, I could have overwritten it. But um, at that moment in time, it seemed like, okay, this is clear cut. I've done my research, it's safe, it's affordable. It's, it looks gorgeous, and I don't have any other concerns, so I made my offer. I'm a technical writer, so I write instruction manuals, and I would say that writing has always been a part of me. Hello. Hey, Pat. Sorry, I lost track of time. Yeah, working. <laughs> uh, listen, is it okay if I pick you up in 20? Okay, great. See you then. Bye.
with the second viewing, I brought my friend Pat along and I just said, hey, could you please just take a look at this? Okay, let me so know if there's anything that I'm missing. Okay, yeah, so I like look for the bodies buried under the floorboards, etc. Exactly, right. Gotcha, <laughs> right. As we were walking in to hey, the duplex. Hey, hey. Thanks so much for organizing. This is such short notice. Um, this is Pat, she's my observant friend. Hey. My friend Pat noticed our doors were right next to each other. So I couldn't enter or exit my front door without also passing by the neighbor's front door. What's up? Door's a bit buddy buddy here. Pat, get in here. I just said, eh, I get along with people, even nasty people, I just get along with. Yeah, I did a lot of this, like, oh, I'll be fine, thanks, but I'll be fine, you know. So, Spring Hills? Yeah, do you like it? Yeah, I, I love it. That's great. Uh-huh. Is there anything I need to know? Like, why the owner's so keen to get out of there? They just wanted a quick sale. Uh -huh. Nothing to worry about. Everything just seemed just perfect. Okay. In fact, when I even started negotiating for the price, um, I successfully knocked down the cost. Okay, thanks, Sally. Speak later. This is great. I am awesome. Happily ever after. So as soon as I uh, closed on the place, I swapped out light fixtures. I had a workman come in and do the painting. There was a certain sort of pride of, this is not only my home, but this is actually a place that I like. As I was unpacking, I was excited. I was excited about the fact that it was the first place that I'd ever owned. So I'm feeling a lot of, hey, I'm an adult now. About four nights after I moved into my duplex, I'm still riding the waves of, I'm awesome, I'm an adult, everything's cute. I was vacuuming or doing some, I was doing some kind of cleanup, unpacking type work. And that's when I heard someone scream. It was completely unexpected. What went through my mind was, did I just hear what I just heard? Is it someone's TV? It has to be someone's TV. Ah! And then the voice repeated it again. Ah! You are dead. I will destroy you. It was coming from the neighbor who I shared a wall with. That's when I realized why I'd gotten such a good deal on my place. After my initial response of, oh no, I of course tried to explain it away and try and find maybe some alternate explanations. The solution that I came up with that I told myself was that she must be rehearsing for a play you know, maybe like a war theme and she's playing the, the role of the Nazis and ha ha ha, I will destroy you. And I knew it wasn't right. You know, it wasn't a right explanation, but I thought I'm just going to run with this and say, who am I to get involved with her art, you know? <laughs> A few days later, I was arranging things, uh, setting stuff on their shelves, and when I started organizing things in my bedroom,
was alarmed when I found the bullet because my first thought was, I wonder if the previous owners of my duplex bought it for protection. I made an immediate connection between the bullet and the crazy screams. Yeah, I know. Hurry up and feed me, Amy. Dad! I live in Kyle! I caught you! Dad! The second occurrence of the screaming happened about two months after I moved in. And again, it was another death threat. I will destroy you. I curse you. Die, I say! And again, it rattled me. The way that I would describe the voice is rage, absolute hatred and rage. And there was also a, an edge of hysteria to it, like a hysterical animal caught in a trap. Die! Die! 911, how can I help you? I think someone's in danger in the apartment next door. They're screaming, arguing. I, I can hear a voice kind of threatening somebody. I called the police and I talked with just a phone operator at dispatch. I can't give you anything else. I, I just, I, I'm concerned that someone's in trouble, you know, real bad trouble. I tried to describe what I was hearing, and I did a pretty bad job of it. Is she talking to a friend? I don't think she has any friends. It was the, the worst police phone call probably on record in humanity. Ma'am, is it possible you were hearing a TV? I'm thinking, I am such an idiot for describing it like this. And the dispatch says, did you get a name? It sounds like I'm a Snoopy neighbor. Just someone who just dials 911 and says, oh my gosh, trouble, 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 and do something, and I can't give you anything else. I live in value! I was just so mortified. Get your facts together, sweetie, and call us back when you have something real. So it was enough for me to say, I, you know, I'm not calling the police again. This is horrible, <laughs> and I'm an idiot. I did try and contact uh, the manager of my homeowner association. No, this is not a dispute. Absolutely not that. Don't you actually have to speak to someone to be in dispute with them? I believe the manager was uh, fully aware that the neighbor was a little bit unstable and he wanted to avoid it as well. So it was enough for, you know, just to feel embarrassed all over again and say, I don't want to be a troublemaker. For the first year, I made a point of not introducing myself, but after a while, it just got to be to, it was something I just couldn't stop ignoring. You will die! Die, I say! I just thought she probably doesn't realize that I can hear this. I cut you! I hate you! I believe that the moment she realized that Someone on the opposite side of the wall was becoming unnerved, anxious, alarmed at her yelling that, you know, she would just apologize. And then I would say, oh, no, no, no problem. And then we would sing Kumbaya and everything would be fine. I will never go this way as you be saved, you know? Die! Die! I will get you. Let me ask you so far, what's the problem here? And at this point, if it were you, 
what could you do at this juncture? Now, I'm going to need somebody to chime in. Okay. Um, she, the lady next door is either crazy or possessed of some, in some manner of speaking. And the lady who bought the house wasn't, didn't follow through enough. She wasn't convinced enough that it actually was a problem, I don't think, when she called the police because she, she could have insisted. She could have made herself heard at that point, and that would have been a really positive step. Other than that, I would have tried to bind whatever was causing problems with that lady next door and um, seeing if that had any effect. Sounds to me like whatever it is, it's an international entity. It's not from this, uh, that, this country. And the discussion, if you listen, and I was paying attention to the discussion, that there's, sound, there's one person there. So this person is either being tormented by an entity of, from her past. It, it, this, whatever it is, it's a familiar spirit, okay? So it's somebody that she has had a dispute with. And like Allison saying, this might be a uh, dementia episode or this might be something that goes on all the time. So what I would do is I would begin to take authority uh, uh, right there. And I think she allowed herself to get unnerved and uh, she started calling Caesar instead of calling the king. I'm assuming that she didn't know anything about spiritual warfare because don't you think she's extremely naive, evidently pretty young too? Uh, yes. She, she, what she said about her own call to the police mm -hmm. was very revealing to me. But yeah, she is extremely naive. I mean, the idea that she just thought that she tried to write it off as somebody practicing some history acting and acting in some historical yeah. play. I, and that, exactly. That also tells you that she's kind of, how, how could I say this, bohemian-ish, uh, kind of uh, live and let live-ish. And that what you were hearing, if you notice, you didn't hear the episodes during the daytime at all. They're always at night. And so, yeah, she knows nothing. Uh, and she, was, she seems to be a very sheltered person, too. I would also say she is not religious in any way. No. Uh -uh. Because otherwise, there would have been something that would have clicked. Mm -hmm. You know, if she was Catholic, Episcopal, anything, she would have went to her pastor or preacher or priest and asked some questions. And they would have been able to put her on to something. Well, you know, she. This is um, a typical person today. Good point. They, they have. What's the last statistics I saw concerning religion? People are leaving organized religion like crazy today, and kids aren't being brought up with that. And this woman sounds like she might be in her twenties or thirties. I think she said. Led a very sheltered life. All right. Um, Anybody else? Yeah, I think uh, she's she's pretty tolerant in in my estimation because I probably at this point would have been pounding on the wall saying "Shut up!" Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't, I don't immediately jump to uh, uh, the idea that I should you know pray for or anything. I I get annoyed first, and then I'd probably go knock on her door and and say, "Hey, can you?" And keep it down or do you need any help or you know what's going on i hear you screaming over there <laughs> it's yeah, keeping, keeping exactly. me awake <laughs> exactly and, and i it, it, it's it's like when you said uh jeremy that she was pretty tolerant it lets you know she's tolerant in more than just that way yeah um, yeah yeah socially she's tolerant uh i mean th this is more tells more about her than the person that was being tormented by that crazy demon. <laughs> Justin, shut up. 
Um, I've had a similar situation to that. And I didn't think of praying for them. The first time I heard it, I went next door, knocked on the door and said, do you need help? Can I sit with you? Is there something I can do for you physically? And I'm surprised she didn't just knock on her door. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly what I was going to say. When I, the first time I had this situation, I did go over there. The problem that I was having is that this couple had children in the next unit. And should I say this? They were copulating day and night and all night was screaming and all bed springs. And it was just, I, I would have probably been able to take it a little better if it wasn't for the fact of what they were doing all the time. And I did go over there and I felt it a little scared because they were both bigger than me. And I, they said, okay, it won't happen again. Nothing changed. Anybody else? have a comment this takes a few twists and turns so so this uh, this is the situation you're uh, beset with sounds like well one time uh, the other time I did was uh, the when I was gone I, I caught the landlord coming in the guy that owned the place I rented the duplex we had been missing things and I caught him one time um, rifling inside the house, rifling through my stuff. And he was just very matter of fact about it. He said, I own this place and I'll come in here anytime I want. Well, I oh, I'd have called the police at that yeah. point. Yeah, I didn't last long. Because uh, now, doesn't Florida have the stand your ground law? Yeah. Now so it does, but back then it didn't. Yeah. I was up north at this time. Oh, okay. But I know that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah that's something. Uh, and also, it, it indicated to me that she knew that those walls were paper thin. When she bought that place, she knew that the walls were that way. So she yeah. knew she was going to be hearing things. I'm just wondering how many, we got 15 here today at least. How many have been in a situation similar to this? I mean, you can, I mean, if, if you don't mind getting on chat, I'd like to see if you're a yes on that. I'm pretty sure I've been in that situation. I can't remember of any specifics, but okay. I lived in some pretty poor, uh, poor housing <laughs> yeah, right. and the walls were paper thin. So, Well, if you can chat it in. In college towns, it happens all the time. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I'll tell you, I had a experience, but this happened only at night. Like, uh, I heard it was probably 3 in the morning. It happened maybe once or twice a week. Uh, somebody above me, they would be going at it. You hear the bed springs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't something out of control. They, It wasn't every day. It wasn't every night even. So meaning, you know, colleges, you do get interesting things going on. And I'm sure mine is, is nothing compared to some other people's experiences in college towns. And I lived there. I lived in a college town for 10 years. So I was mm -hmm. blessed or whatever that things weren't too bad. When it, I've had it happen to me, like I said, in college towns, what I found that worked is to embarrass them. And you embarrass them and it stopped trust me it stopped how did you embarrass them i you know i'd see the person in the store and it, i never did it with the women i always did it with the fellas mm -hmm. and you go up to them and you just have a conversation and all of a sudden it's like and you know forgive me for saying this i'm like hey man sound like you was having a good time last night but you know you may want to keep it down a little bit because not sound like he was hitting it a little hard <laughs> and that ended it that i'm not going to get your get yours but you know what i'm saying keep it down on the on the down low and never again well in my case the their libido must have been through the roof because at least 
what I was thinking is that it went on just constantly. Of course, that's not the case, but especially at night, several times at night and during the day, and it was so loud, and that mattress was so squeaky, and they were both making a lot of utterances there. But if, if this has been the case for you, just pop something in the chat. Maybe you can go ahead and just um, describe it a little bit, and I'll go back to the audio now for the next part. Because we're just kind of pouring this thing out right now. There's more. Okay. I took a deep breath. I could hear that someone was coming at the door at full speed. Yes, you. And then she opened the door and there she was. What I saw was just a wild, disoriented look. I heard you screaming. Is everything okay? Oh, yes. It's true. Sometimes I get upset. But you don't want to hear it, so I will try to stop. How can you try to not yell? You either do it or you don't do it. But she kept talking and it was like she didn't even see me. I was wondering. I like the changes you have made to the apartment. It looks good. You have done just a little warning went off in my head, saying, "Warning, something not right is happening." I like the bookshelves. Where did you get these bookshelves? The position of the TV makes more space, and the curtains, better than before, much better than they were before. And I thought, holy cow, no. What do you mean you walked into my place without my permission? I was really alarmed that someone yelling death threats just sauntered into my place to have a look-see. Um, I've got to get back to work. I'm I just knew I had to get out of there. I'm going to split. Did you get this nice handy woman to make your cupboards? Maybe she will make some cupboards for me. You have better taste than the people that lived here before. They did not stay long, but they did not have I wish I'd never knocked on that door. But when I look back, I don't see how I could have avoided it. So about a week or two after my first encounter with the neighbor, I found a note taped on my door, and it was from my homeowner association. When I opened it up, I found a stock form um, telling me that I was in violation of the HOA bylaws. My curtains were the wrong color. And that for consistency and overall appearance with the community, I needed to change my curtains to white immediately. I felt just a little bit of rage. Or get rid of that. You guys grill. can't enforce the noise bylaws, but I have curtains that are the wrong color. Come on. <laughs> Over the course of that next year, the neighbor's screams got more, more frequent. And they became much more animalistic. When the neighbors started screaming, it was completely unpredictable. It could happen early in the morning as I was getting ready for work. It could happen as I was getting ready for bed or in bed. It was unsettling, not knowing when she was going to start or when it would stop.
So the second encounter with the neighbor began just as I was coming home from work. The doormat. I like your doormat very much. Where did you get this doormat? Um, from the Homer store on East and Fifth. It's really nothing special. Before I got my key in the door, I could hear her, and the first thought that went through my head is, she knows when I'm coming and going. I'm going to get one just like that. The exact same one. I'm going to have one just like you. The thing is, my doormat was pretty stupid. And like, as soon as I bought it and threw it in front of the door, I thought, oh my gosh, why did I get it? But I just kept it, because I'd already shelled out the money. I'm going to have one just like you. Maybe we can go to the homeware store together. <laughs> The same doormat as you. Me and Amy, Amy and me, we will be the same me and Amy. And she repeated, I want to be just like you. I'm going to get that doormat just like you. Doormat and doormat, the exact same one. So I come home after work. It was a pretty standard day. And I realize that there are a huge stack of boxes piled outside my front door. Every single box was labeled police in big, bold, sharpie, black letters. All labeled police, 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 police. My first thought was, She's trying to send me a message that she wanted me to realize how important she was to be in so much trouble with the police. I'm not even sure if the boxes had anything in them. What is all this? Shh, go inside. When one of my friends saw it, she said, did you go through them? Let's look. And I thought, no, I think she wants me to go through them. And I think she's going to know if I go through them. I said, we're not touching those boxes outside my door. Just ignore the elephant in the living room. They don't exist. The boxes remained outside my door for about three weeks. Um, at the end of the three weeks, what I believe happened is that the neighbor was getting annoyed that I wasn't asking her about them. So she taped a, a gorgeous card on my door. Inside, she had written, Oh, neighbor, I am so sorry about the boxes. I'm sure they're in your way. Uh, don't worry, I'll be removing them soon. I took the card as an indicator that she was getting frustrated, that I wasn't giving her the response she wanted. But what that address label on the outside of the card also did was I had her full name and the correct spelling of her last name. And that was the start of my scurrying away evidence for the police. One day I came home, all the boxes were gone, and I just breathed a sigh of relief. Over the next few weeks, I was in the mindset of out of sight, out of mind. Um, was uneasy coming home. I was making a point of coming and going from my place much more quietly, because at that point I was aware that she was aware. So I was becoming very aware of how I was living my daily life. But I knew she was sending me a message, I'm here, I'm here, I know where you're, where you are. And it, what was scary about it is that knowing that she was so focused on what I was doing. One day, I just had the TV on. The New York Met just happened to be on. I'm not a fan of opera, but it was better than infomercials. After I'd been playing for a while, I heard the next door neighbor singing. It was a segment from Carmen, you know, the dun 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 dun, dun but it's horrible. Again, how do you explain to the police she's singing? 
But it was that underlying current of she's listening to what I have on TV. But for Pete's sake, Carmen, you know, stop. What's escalated here? Doesn't this begin to sound like intentional harassment? Oh, well, there are many things. There are a few things that have escalated because the sounds that the neighbor is making, the yelling at one point was literally like a dog. Um, that's something that there's the, if you did not see or could not see that there was something um, maybe out of this world going on, um, then that would possibly be, uh, that should be evidence. And of course, the second one, yes, intentional harassment, definitely. Yeah, but I, I get the feeling at this point, and let me correct something, because remember I told you earlier, it sounded like all this stuff was going on at night. Well, that was cleared up in this segment, that it happened early in the morning, that it happened at night, it happened whenever. It sounds like, for whatever reason, they do not want her there. And so this person is using, uh, she might be loony, uh, but whatever's going on, it, it, it seems that the attempt is to drive her from that place. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I think she's doing it in a very covert manner, or maybe overt manner, that is paying so much attention mm -hmm. to everything she does. Oh, that would just drive me crazy. Somebody paying attention to everything I did. Maybe <laughs> you see what happens here in the in the observer is a, a paranoia builds up. Desperate loneliness. Oh, definitely. That's it. That, that, yes. And you overpay attention trying to make friendships. But I think there's a little bit, there's something a little bit more sinister going on here. Oh, yeah. I do too. It seemed, it seemed like she had an opportunity there to spend some time with the lady and talk to her when she asked her to go to the hardware store to pick out the mat. I feel like if all this was going on and there was really such a big problem, just take her out to the hardware store, help her find a mat, and just talk to her and see what the situation is going on. Just kind of bite the bullet a little bit there and try to get a little more information. <clears throat> well, I mean, when it first started happening, I would have went and knocked on the door, but if that didn't solve anything, I would have looked for an opportunity to just sit down and have a talk with them and maybe try to make friends. Yeah, I think a, a more outgoing people would certainly do that. I would do that. It would probably take a great big leap of courage for this woman is naive as she is but yes i think that you're you're on the right track there definitely anybody else also jack something that um people should think about is why is this happening see back in the day uh people like our parents would have already been over there they would have known who this woman was they would have known everything about her by the time, so when these things started happening, they would have brought it to this person's attention. And this generation, we move into places, um, we mind our own business, we don't talk to anybody around that, around that area. I mean, heck, you could be up in there dead and stank for about three or four weeks before anybody would even notice. That's well, also a big part of this as well. I think that has a lot to do with the cultural climate that we're in today. Exactly. Everybody is getting trounced for one thing or the other. You're, you don't know. You know, I, I was thinking that, gee, I can't even go say hello to a child anymore. anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. I mean, somebody like my mother, community woman, as she was, she would have already dragged that person down to the church for what you call it already. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that she heard that they would have came in there. And that's the way our community functioned. So uh, that's a big part of what's going on here. Is what that? Is, go ahead. You could invite her to church. Exactly. Well, to, <laughs> piggy, to piggyback on what Daniel was saying, that 
there are um, still some people in communities that I'm aware of that they know everybody and every car that comes down the road past the house. Um, every car going up the hill, down the hill, turns left, turns right, they can ID almost to a T who is in the car. So it could be seen as nosy, but also it's a, it was a form of survival in the South for some communities. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's, yeah, don't it? That's good stuff. Yeah. Um, to know your neighbors before you move in, that would have saved this wouldn't have happened because she probably would have said, you know what, this is a little creepy and I don't want to do it, even if the place is right. And we did that somewhat here. Um, when we moved here, you know, you know, big blind me, I'd go up and I'd knock on my neighbor's door and I'd stand my big self in the frame and say, hey, I want to let you know who I am. I just moved, I'm moving in next door. Uh, if, if, if there's anything that we can do for you, let us know. Uh, same thing with the person upstairs. All, all, everybody here knows who we are because we because what we did is we we put ourselves out front and we put our face on their face and say, "Hey, these are who we. This is who we are. Uh, you know, if you need anything, let us know. If you can help us, let us know." And this lady is probably absent from that, and that's why you see the anguish that she's going through. And if you don't do what I tell you, I'm going to knock your head off. I feel like that sometimes. Don't you? The flesh gets a hold of you, and that's your first, that's uh, maybe a, a first thought on of course, a situation like that because so much animosity builds up. Yeah, the first thought would be that you want it to stop. Whatever is going on, the yelling, the screaming, you know, you, you might not be so fast to understand because you want to establish a pattern you might say even if somebody who is religious might say that's a little strange but i might need a little bit more but the first thing of course whatever the problem is the noise is the um disruption is you want it to stop everyone does oh, yeah. and notice what she didn't do she did not go to the ho to the to the housing um uh the little board that they have there that runs that place because they already had complaints about this woman uh, long. Who do you and suppose put the complaint in? I wonder. She did. Yeah. She was the one. And also, uh, keep in mind, they have a right to do that. They have a right to do that because I know that a certain place, remember Tanya Gov, our friends in South Florida, they lived in a place like that where yes. you, everything has to be right or the Honorable Association could call you on it. And so what she didn't do is for the noise ordinance, call her neighbor on the noises. She kept quiet. Her embarrassment kept her silent. True, true. Let's go on to the next segment. It escalates even further. It was unsettling, not knowing when she was going to start or when it would stop. The neighbor's screams got even more animalistic. So whenever she got into a manic state, it was so close, so real, it felt like it was happening inside my own home. No, 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 <laughs> there was one day she just started shouting outside the window. You are so stupid! Do you not understand? It was almost like her manifesto to the world. I hate everybody. I hate the United States. Why do you not understand? Ah, oh, this is America! I hate United States of America! Then she yelled my name. Why do you not understand this, Amy? You are so stupid. So in the middle of all this benign stuff, here's a spike. Here's like one segment of evidence that, yeah, she is yelling at me. Why do you not understand this, Amy? And 
I very clearly heard her masturbating. And this isn't the first time that I've lived in cheap apartments. I'm no stranger to waking up and hearing sex at night for the people next door. And then in another flash, I realized she wants me to hear this. And she's doing it very clearly. And she wants me to hear. She wants me to marvel at her sexual prowess. And she wants some kind of a response. And it led me to start wondering if she was attracted to me in some way. When I realized I can't let her know that I hear this. And it was at that moment that I realized she is doing this on purpose. She is targeting me. This isn't just an oops moment. This is real, a real assault. So my first response was grabbing my Doc Martens and I had my arm like this, ready to throw it. And just a little voice inside of my head just said, stop don't do it. And so I'm standing like this, trying to figure out why I'm telling myself to stop. And it was just stop, don't do it. She's doing it on purpose. Don't let her know. Do not give her any indication that you are here. So I had no choice but to just crawl back into bed, do my best with the pillow tactic of putting them over my ears and to just wait it out until she stopped. I felt like I'd been sexually assaulted. But again, how can you prove that it's a sexual assault? If my next door neighbor had been a man and was doing that same thing in the shower, it would have been so much more clear cut. Bam, bam, you're a perv. But this was a woman. I believed that she was going to lose control and come out after me. I was afraid of a physical assault, and I was also afraid of rape. Rape? Yeah, I decided to learn a bit of self-defense. Hey! I stink at karate. I found that out really quickly. Yeah. I'm clumsy. I'm horrible. They stuck me with the 12 year olds. I, I tried. I tried for two months. And my friends did yell at me, saying, you need this. And I'm coming back and telling them, 12-year-olds are kicking my butt. I can't do this. I just had to say, I give up. In the spring of 2009, I put my house back on the market, hoping that I would be able to get away from the neighbor. That's about when the housing market crashed. Do you like this one? Yeah, I like this one. Does it have a cat flap? Let me see. Doesn't say on here. Keep looking. I'll keep looking. So for me to get away from her would have meant dumping my place and going significantly in the debt. That's when I started to feel trapped. Now when I look through resources that my county gives to stalking victims, I see that the first thing that they say is, hey, move from your place. And they're assuming that the victims are renters. I'm not a renter, I'm a homeowner. Being able to visit other friends, I just didn't want to shoulder my friends with this burden of now they have to take care of me. Some people I, I talk to more than others. Uh, 
I also gauged how good of a friend they were based on how much I unloaded on them. So maybe one person would hear this part of the story, and if I knew I complained to this person this week, then I could say, okay, next week I'm going to give them a break and I'm going to tell someone else what's going on. If I need help with a certain resource, I'm going to go to this friend now. So it did become strategizing, saying, I need to go to this friend for this piece of help and no more. One of my friends said, hey, if you ever need to crash my place, do it. And I did do it, but I did it once. And I know I could have stayed longer, but you know, fish and guests, they stink after three days, no matter how bad it is. It was important to me. It was a means of escape. And I also realized that if I abused it, I ran the risk of losing my friendships. You really need to get your other neighbors involved in this. I'm telling you, Pat, they don't want to know. I mean, would you get involved? Absolutely. I wish you'd listen to me. You really need to end this, Amy. I just went on a fact-finding mission. What I encountered was just that downplaying and minimizing. Did you notice how this escalated in this last segment? It becomes personal and sexual. And have you ever known people who were so desperate for attention that if they couldn't get attention for something good, well, attention for something bad is still attention. How about it? Yeah, I had a neighbor kind of like that, but it was a couple and they're, they were older and they had a couple of late teenage kids. And I don't know if they were trying to do this for attention as much as they just did it. I mean, they would basically be out this was a pretty low rent kind of neighborhood and they would go out in the front yard around their cars any time of the day or night engage in sex out in the open screaming yelling usually crazy messed up and if you ever said anything to them you had to pretend they weren't there <clears throat> they'd be they'd be staring at you the whole time and if you call the police on them it's like, I don't know if they had radar or something that was protecting them, because the second the cop popped over the hill, they were not there anymore, and nothing was going on. And none of the other neighbors would say anything, because these people would retaliate. They oh. retaliated against me. They turned trash in my yard. They broke my fence. They drive their car in my yard and turf it. And they would do that to anybody. And I don't know if they were trying to get attention, but it would get real personal right in your face if you made any noise at all about it. Cold water works. <laughs> Good point. I'm kind of wondering why she didn't document. You can always put a recorder on and document the time and the day. Uh, that's what's required for any kind of harassment deal. But well, that's they, in, that, that is... Jack, that is interesting. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, go ahead. They, yeah, this is 2009. It's not like things like this aren't available. She could have got a digital recorder, voice recorder, mm -hmm. and it would have been, you could even set it up so it would have been sound sensitive. When things started, it, it would have started. started. But okay. there, there are tons and tons of ways to document. But that, again, that, as I was saying earlier, this is a generational problem where these guys, these young cats today, they tried to mind their business, not get concerned about what's going on in the community and stuff. If you notice, there was nothing about any community action, uh, 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 um, relationships or anything until she got in trouble. She started talking to her friends slowly about what was going on, 
but this probably had gone on for months. Oh, sure. Before she even opened her mouth to anybody about it. And that's the way this generation is. They don't, they don't say anything. I'm telling you, they could, she could have been dead up in there, stank for three or four weeks before anybody would have noticed anything. Mm -hmm. That's big. Well, you know, for the, the poor uh, victims from her, on her side, she, uh, she never had a, owned a home or anything before. And she was really, you know, invested in this thing. And she, is thinking about trying to get out of it. But what do you do with this lady next door? You'll never be able to sell a place. You'll lose your shirt. You'll end up broke and maybe not able to uh, you know, afford anywhere to live. So she was kind of held hostage by this neighbor's behavior too. So, you know. I don't know that I believe that. I believe that if she, if they, if she would have confronted the issue, um, I believe that a lot of that stuff would have stopped. Because if she was doing this on purpose, and if you know, did you notice something? Very Eastern European. Um, I think uh, Eastern European, Russian, something like that. Uh, there's something wrong there. And it was not, I mean, come on, even if you needed to set her up so that she can get Baker acted, that could have worked mm -hmm. with the record or something like that as well. Yeah. But again, it comes down to these guys' generation I mean, uh, being quiet. How do you think 9-11 happened? The same way. People were quiet. These people came into that community over there. They observed. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to ever check out the Al-Qaeda uh, manual. I have. I've checked it out a couple of times. One of the things they are counting on is this generation's ability to want to be quiet and not communal. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that happened with this lady here. Uh, people are afraid today to talk about anything, but you got to think of it on two levels, too, as we said at the beginning here. There's uh, personal harassment here, but also there's a demonic harassment that the renter or the owner does not know how to deal with, number one. And number two, even if the wooden, woman didn't say another word, just the knowledge now that that thing was there is going to be a ball and chain around the leg because of the demonic oppression. Okay, let's finish this out. I want to ask one question first, though. Suppose I wanted to share what's in the chat anonymously on the podcast. Is there anybody that would not want to render permission for that i promise it would be completely anonymous all right if if somebody doesn't want to give permission just uh chat it in there and and we'll finish up this little presentation Hi, um, I was just wondering if you've had any problems with noise from the neighbor at 13? No, no. Then I uh, knocked on another door. Oh, hi, I I'm so sorry to bother you. I was wondering whether you know my neighbor at number 13. She's had a few problems recently, and I, I just thought maybe if everyone got together and... She seems disturbed. We'll pray for her. You know, and I don't say, I think that prayer is necessarily a bad thing, but what I was encountering from the people I asked was this feeling of, oh, there's a problem, but just, you know, let's just keep our distance from it. Another neighbor had said, yeah, absolutely wonderful woman. In fact, she tried to share her medication with me when I told her I was depressed. And I started wondering, how mentally ill is she? And how much medication should she be taking? And why isn't she taking it? I, I should go. I felt like I was being that troublesome neighbor. 
the one who was trying to be the finger pointer, the one who was saying, oh, let's all rally against this bad person. Um, I felt really ashamed and embarrassed. After the neighbors started escalating against me, I realized that I needed to fight back. I can't let her destroy me in one way or another. I just have to keep going. The thing that a log does is that it not only gives a track record of harassment, but it also shows patterns. I started realizing that the only really good means of fighting that I had was my brain. and my ability to organize, and my ability to communicate information, at least within a printed format. I, I was very obviously not good at verbal communication, but that log, that consistent, meticulous, as meticulous as I would allow myself, it was presenting evidence that I couldn't articulate, it, it, the, just how disturbing the whales were. That log, it was my best defense. When I started doing the recordings, it was at the time where I was still trying to prove that her noise was out of control. And just how disturbing the whales were, how horrible, and hopefully that it would be an, another venue to say, hey, this woman needs help. I come home from work and I just went to the mailbox to get my mail. And at that point, I was scared. So I turned and walked in another direction. She turned to follow me. At that moment, I decided I was going to go to my neighbor Jane's house. Her house was pretty close, and so I figured I'll just hot-foot it over to her place. I didn't want to cast too many, you know, glances over my shoulder, but I could see out of my peripherals that the neighbor was coming up that walkway, too. I was relieved that at least she let me in, but it was also awkward because it was clear that she didn't want to get involved. By me being inside of her house, if the neighbor came out after me, that Jane would also be affected with it. <laughs> I felt guilty, awkward. Jane just very clearly wanted me out of her house. At that moment, a line had been crossed. She's coming out after me. It was clear from the moment, even before I put my key in the door, that it was a particularly bad day for the neighbor. I need to leave now, I don't want to hear this, that I thought that I could just sneak out very quietly without her hearing me. But she heard me, she always heard me. So it became a, an exercise in myself to just not let panic overtake me. Yes, I'm hearing someone coming from behind me, but I just need to very calmly get to the car and leave. And as soon as I pulled out onto the street, I thought that I'd made it. I saw the car, I saw her. <laughs> It's worse now. She's followed me. <laughs> oh, you're so stupid, baby! <laughs> All of my fears are starting to, to come to light. They are starting to be realized. And everything's in slow motion. 
She always knew how to stop just short of it being a crime or being obvious that she was coming out after me. I was afraid that she'd loop back around and find me. So I figured if I could just go home and pack really quickly, wherever she's going, maybe I can beat her and I can get out. I bounced around a lot. For a while, I was living in the basement with a couple of 20-something uh, bachelors. Then I moved into another spare bedroom. It was a demoralizing feeling. I've lost everything now. I, I can't live in my home. And now I'm basically having to beg for cheap rent so that I can at least keep my head above water and still go to work. I was out of my house for seven months. Hey, Amy, what are you doing back? When I went back to check on my place, I would run into neighbors and they would say, oh my gosh, now we know what you're talking about because now she's coming out after us. Okay, um, I'll, I'll see you later. It stopped being my problem and then became everyone's problem. The only thought that was going through my head is finish this, just finish this. When she started following me, that's when I was able to say, hey, she's stalking me. She has been coming out after me. She's following me. Can I get that stalking order? I was routed to a police officer, Detective Thompson, who was trained in the mental health area. So he made it very clear that he is first a police officer. He is not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but he has been trained in the mental health area in regards to helping him fulfill his role as a police officer. Honestly, I can't tell you what it means to finally speak to someone who understands. Glad to be of service, Amy. I'll do everything I can to help. You are all so stupid! You must be cursed! I it's Amy, you see. Amy's crazy stalker. I was terrified. You're stupid, American. You're stupid. I hate you, baby. I hate you, baby. I realized that I should be recording this, that this would be the most blatant evidence that I could provide. Amy's crazy stalker. I would say walking those five steps to my door and purposefully clamping that phone on the door was probably one of the bravest things I've done. She is liar and criminal. I will destroy you. Just saying, I know what you're doing and you are now three inches away from me, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to record every single horrible thing. She is stalking me and now you will see. I do I upset you, Amy? Shall I pay you a few dollars? I finally convinced myself I need to call the police again. This is what comes to. She is liar and criminal. I will destroy you. And so they sent two representatives over. Stay away from me, you No! You people don't understand. Tell me that you must speak to. She has serious mental health problems. You need to speak to. Amy. When the mental health people told her Amy can get you arrested, it scared her, and she took off. And she was gone for about three weeks, hiding out from the law. The neighbor was arrested for stalking Amy and for the violation of two previous stalking orders. The police finally caught up with her a few weeks later outside in a parking lot yelling. She was arrested for stalking. I had several court appearances with her. During the time, she was just as disruptive in court as she was in my personal life. 
uh, constantly uh, interrupting the judge and the the court clerks. Um, at one point, when she she was escorted into the courtroom with four very large bailiffs, escorting her in and out. Um, my good friend Pat was with me at the time, and she just gave me a nudge, saying, "You know, do you see all those four guys, all those bailiffs?" She says they're lining up for you. Do you realize that, you know, you little you was dealing with her all by yourself, and now here's these very large men escorting her in and out. Um, I also had a victim's caseworker working with me, and she's giving me a nudge from the other side and saying, you know, we usually have like only two bailiffs in the courtroom. There's one inside and one outside. And she said that the fact that there's four, four escorting her in and out, that sends a signal to the judge of just how dangerous she is. When the actual criminal case went to trial, we ended up settling out of court. Amy successfully obtained another stalking order against her. Under the terms of the order, Amy's neighbor avoided a jail term, but was banned from any future contact. The neighbor was also evicted from Amy's community and was explicitly barred from ever returning. I'll never feel like it's over. It's hard to describe just how horrible of a hole it left inside of me. Just the realization that someone actively tried to destroy me. Yo! Yo! I live in the same place now, and I know that the neighbor knows that she decided to come back out after me. She could find me. Hi. I don't know where my stalker is now. Good morning. Welcome to the neighborhood. Good morning. I'm sure I will be very happy here. <laughs> All's well that ends well, but it took so long. I don't think I would have settled that out of court. I'd, I'm sure that I'd had her go to jail. And oh, I would have been lobbying. I would have been standing on the judge's bench demanding mm -hmm. that she be locked up, or at least that she seek mental health uh, therapy. Because if you notice, that's what got lost in all of this. They had a court appearance. Yeah. She never got help. And she was uh, convicted of two other stalkings before. Exactly. That. So this is a pattern. Well, I think this is something, too, that we can often leave up to Yahweh. I mean, we got to do warfare with such people as that, but there's a hope that he'll just get rid of them. And I think we need to pray specifically in that way and take any action that we can. I don't think that Yahweh's going to deal with a situation like this unless we take some uh, initiative as well. So any other comments about this or any suggestions before I ask you two more questions? Yeah, I wanted to say that I think that whole situation could have gone down so differently. I mean, without the charges and this and that, and she could have been held if this lady would have just not been so paranoid and, you know, I guess just in fear of everything that she was in so much fear. She couldn't even help someone that was really dealing with some true, you know, fear that she had no peace at all. And she's like, she didn't even want to try to give her any peace. Mm -hmm. And she was so afraid of bodily injury that she went and did karate with the 12 year olds. I mean, that's, that's real fear when so you think that somebody is going to attack you physically at any time. All right, a couple questions. One, do you like this uh, format? You want to do this format again sometime? Sure. Rich, Rich is uh, he's helping the uh, Tennessee Right to Life today with judging some high school kids and their 
I think, oral presentations about uh, the pro-life beliefs. So he's gone. And um, if you like this, yeah, we could try it again. I enjoyed it a whole lot. And the finally, if you had a chance to think about that situation I told you at the first, restitution, because what she had said to me is that I do not want to be your friend. What restitution would you demand? What do you think I demanded? Give up? You said that that person had done you some financial harm? Every kind of harm, yes, reputation, financial, the ahad, nearly destroyed the ahad, huh. and uh, on social media, all kinds of um, uh, starting, starting um, a campaign of, all I can say is hatred. For yeah. Me, but other people. All right. Well, here's what I did. It came to me just a little bit ago, and that is, for restitution, you've got to be my friend. She wrote back, oh, you are bad. That's it. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. I sure enjoyed it. See you next time. I'm bad. B -b 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 bad.